please welcome Liz Dozier and Rami Nashashabi from our next conversation, The Future is Safe. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be here with Rami Nashashibi in conversation um, and talking about safety. Uh, we were chatting a little bit backstage and we were thinking about how I think the natural part of this conversation or what people might expect is for us to begin this conversation with some statistics and to really focus our conversation around guns or gangs or police and those types of things as we begin to talk about safety. And we, we know those stats exist. We know that those issues are real. I'm gonna give you a couple of stats in a second. But we wanted to focus our conversation really on a larger a conversation around approach and what are some of the real solutions and real systemic things that can take place and that are taking place in our communities. So just to ground us all in what we're talking about here as we think about Chicago and as we think about safety issues, uh, we know that the Chicago Police Department says the total number of shootings and murders for August of 2019 are truly at their lowest and at their lowest since 2011. We know that murders fell almost 23% from 46 in August to 59 in August of 2018. Shooting incidents are down 19% uh, last month from 125, I'm sorry, 125 in 2019, and they were at 263 in August of 2018. And while that's all said and done, we know that there are still over 1,400 people who have been shot here in Chicago year to date, and that there have been over 300 murders in the city. And so as we think about those, and again, you, it might be an obvious way to, for us to really have our conversation about gangs and guns and, and just the violence overall, but from our perspective, it doesn't really get to the heart of the matter. And so we believe if we're gonna make a seismic shift here that we need to open up that conversation and go a little bit deeper. And so I'm gonna turn to you uh, just with this question around, uh, you know, your work is really around holistic healing. That's what Iman uh, has stood for for the last 20 years. And tell us a little bit about what that means from your perspective and specifically what it means to some of the implications for violence in our city. Yeah. Um, first of all, good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be upon all of you. Um, it's always a privilege to be on any stage with Liz Dozier so, um, and to all of you. But, you know, among, you cited a couple stats in the opening, and, and this is a conversation. Uh, that we've been having in Chicago for several decades, quite frankly, uh, and there have been episodic spikes of violence that many you know, scholars have attempted to correlate with a whole number of things. Um, and those studies are important, and they, they matter. Um, yet I, I think a lot of us continue to maintain, even as a person who's privileged enough to think about this sociologically and be among uh, scholars of the highest caliber you know, conducting many of these studies, that a lot of the insight is pretty intuitive. It's not counterintuitive. And I think part of the interventions are, you know, make a lot of sense. I mean, you take among the thousands of stats, let me give you one, and I think it links to this idea of why for us, holistic health, well and health, health wellness and healing, and that approach is so critical. You know, one stat was you take one of the, the most recent spikes of violence that we're all talking about in the city is 2016, right? Uh, our numbers went 700 plus and we've been of homicides and we've been struggling every, uh, every year since and we've been seeing some reductions, of course. Um, but that spike, think about what led to that spike from among the things that led to it. From 2000 to 2015, the rate of neighborhoods, of people living in extreme poverty in neighborhoods across the city grew 384%. Um, and when you think about the consequences of that, the day in, day out consequences in neighborhoods on the south and west sides particularly, you think about the pain, you think about the struggle, you think about the massive disinvestment. The approach that an organization like Iman has been taking 
uh, and we knew intuitively we needed to take from our inception was we needed to approach holistically to build, to attempt to rebuild and in some cases build for the first time healthy ecosystems that really provide those that we're engaging with with a kind of a whole sense to heal as full human beings. And so running a health center wasn't just enough. And we're very you know, grateful and elated. Last week after a multiple 15 year journey, we finally got designated as a federally qualified health center of full health uh, last week. We're the first in the state of, the only in the state of Illinois to be uh, given that designation this last week. So we're all, we're all geeked. But, and, and part of our struggle to, to honestly, the, the journey there is that a lot of us were organizers. A lot of us knew, you know, we were told early on, you're doing a little too much. You're running a whole list. You're trying to run a health center and you have programs for, for uh, returning citizens and you're doing this arts and culture stuff and you're doing community organizing. It's not, you know, you're going to hone in and do one or the other. And that, that compelling argument made sense, but it didn't seem to align with the realities of our people on the ground, that our communities, it wasn't just enough to run a health center. We needed to think about how they were connected to housing, how the issues of real health and wellness were connected to diet and access to fresh food, and how people, uh, their ability to see themselves as not just passive victims, but really yeah. active participants required them being involved in organizing, changing the conditions in the community, taking a stake in their own future. And all of those things combined for us have kind of produced this holistic approach that, you know, has been critical uh, for the way Amanda does our work. And I think about our story, you know, and, and our relationship over the years. I think, you know, as you talked about your story multiple times, you, this holistic approach and this idea about, you know, certainly the, the story of violence in Chicago is one you've experienced personally. Yeah. I know from many of our conversations, you've grown up, you've lived in these neighborhoods, you've experienced it in your family. Many people know your story is associated as with the principal of Finger High School and you experienced it and saw it, uh, certain things at that vantage point. And now you're, you know, leading a major effort through Chicago Beyond, that is, I think, making extraordinary interventions. Um, how has your perspective changed? How has it grown? How has it deepened about this idea of violence and, and different approaches? I think it's, it's deepened. I mean, when I, when I think about the work that happened at the high school, and I think about our young people and what was happening in the school, right? When I think about, you know, 300 arrests happening inside of the school building that first year, or, you know, 20% of the kids dropping out, or a 40% graduation rate. Like, that wasn't happening because of any one single factor, right? It wasn't like the kids were just bad kids, the school was a bad school, or the community of parents were bad, right? It was this combination of effects, everything from trauma to poverty, to family discord, I mean, all these things that were wrapped up mm -hmm. that caused some of the numbers that we were seeing. And ultimately, what made the seismic shift that we had at Finger High School, you know, going from 300 arrests to virtually none, yeah. you know, doubling those graduation rates to 40 to 80 percent, and the dropout rate going down to below 2 percent, truly had to do with us. Um, acknowledging and accepting the human experience of where our kids were in terms of their trauma mm -hmm. and figuring out how to how to support them in that work, having academic interventions, having grief counseling and all these things built into the course of the school day so our kids could be successful. When I think about the work as it relates to Chicago Beyond, it's really been like this journey, right, mm -hmm. of like how do we think about some of those same lessons that I learned when I was at Finger High School? How does that play out on a bigger stage as we think about the support of community-based organizations, of ideas, of individuals who are trying to create a more just and a more equitable city? And how do we give them the pathway to begin to address some of the same things that are happening on a macro level that were in a micro level at the school? Um, I was in Milwaukee. I was sharing with Rami uh, backstage. I was in Milwaukee last week with a colleague of mine, and we were speaking to a group of it's roughly about 40 philanthropists, and it was a small panel of uh, other philanthropists, and we were speaking to a small group of, again, 40 philanthropists, and we were talking about our work. And one of the, it was, it was a private conversation, and one of the, the women uh, raised her hand, it was, it was all women, and she said um, to, to us on the, the panel, she said, you know, 
tell me, tell me this, like from your perspective, which is the communities that you serve, and these women were in Milwaukee, I was only one from Chicago. She's like, what do they really care about? She was like, is it that you know, the communities are so wrapped up in you know, general ideas of safety and housing and food inequities, and that's where their time is spent. They really don't spend much time thinking about education. She's like, because I really believe education is the key to all of this. And you know, I kind of pause, and the room actually answered the question, you know, for me. Um, and I kind of followed up with just saying that, you know, the people that we serve are fundamentally no different and want the same things that you know you want for your children, right? And so it's not just that a, their child has food and is safe, you know, as a parent, right? You want your child to actually thrive. And if we begin to think of our work, and this is what I admire so much about your work, it is not just about the basics, again, of safety or housing, yeah. but is really about fundamentally developing and, and allowing people to really thrive into their full selves. As I think about this conversation, on safety, it's why we wanted to really talk about it in such a more of a holistic way. Because we can't just look at a reduction in numbers and say, like, aha, we've got something, right? It has to be more than that if we think about a healthy and a thriving city for yeah. all. Yeah, I think that's such a, the idea of creating pathways. Again, this is intuitive, right? Um, none of our, none of us just want, you know, it was a brother that, um, we often, he often asks folks, you know, how are you doing? And they say, you know, I'm surviving. And he would respond by saying, man, listen, rats survive, right? <laughs> we got to do better than just surviving. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's a real keen insight. Like we, you know, I was just on the phone this morning with a young brother who graduated in our program just recently. Um, I'm going to call him Jonah. Jonah was shot um, uh, while standing with a friend on July 4th weekend last year. Um, he was almost killed. He was maybe a month or two in our program. That weekend we had gotten so many guys out of town, we couldn't get Jonah because he was on parole. Uh, literally the rest of the cohort, we, we have a full chapter in Atlanta and, and we do a lot of excursions during peak violence weekends to knowing preemptively. Unfortunately, Jonah, we couldn't get him out of town and, got, and, and he was shot. Um, and he was hit, I think, three times. They put him on a colonoscopy bag. Uh, he's a young man. I think he was only 19 at the time. Um, and, it, and it was devastating for him, uh, not only f uh, physically, but also mentally. It just the stigma of walking around with the bag, the stigma of coming back. The way, though, Jonah recovered, um, and he's still on a path of recovery, uh, but eventually he recovered physically. He got back. He was back into the program. Um, two weeks ago, uh, a senior team led by the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield came down and they were in a work day. And we had some of our participants who kind of facilitated a workshop with them. And Jonah was there and he was engaged. He was energetic. He was. And, and I, I pointed out and the CEO, Steve, and, and the new CEO here, and I had a conversation because Jonah was in his group. And he said something. He said, you know, as extraordinary and as, in, you know, just uh, awesome as a force, the Blue Cross Blue Shield is as a health system, we couldn't touch the life of Jonah the way you are right now. In other words, Jonah is in, uh, back in a program. He's in housing with us. He's engaged every day. Even when he was in work, we were able to put him in behavior health, you know, sessions with our uh, behavior health therapist. He was thinking about his future. He was constantly engaged in different type of possibilities for job trajectories, career trajectories. And all of that was about his recovery. All that was about his healing. The possibility, when I spoke to him this morning, you know, there was a type of, he knows, like all of the participants in our program, that we don't want them just to survive. Of course we want them to live. And that is a prime, that's the prime directive when it comes to violence. But we know in order for our communities to really be resilient, we want, we want what any community wants. We want them to have ownership over the communities. The homes that they're rehabilitating, that they're training on, we want them to own those homes. They want to feel like they own their neighborhoods. And when you hear that in Isaiah's voice, you have something to live for. You have something to thrive for. And interestingly enough, I think sometimes the conversations about violence that look at the real, you know, raw data, so unfortunately, and from my standpoint and the way I experience it, so often miss 
this real critical element about what holistic health, wellness, and healing looks like. And it has to include a pathway of thriving, of owning your, feeling like you have a stake yeah. in the future that the, the larger city is a part of. And so oftentimes, when you walk around neighborhoods and you look at extreme poverty, it also corresponds with displacement. It also corresponds with the idea that you don't have a stake in the future of this city. And my concern, even about the numbers about reduction, and I'm grateful we've reduced numbers, but I simply don't want, and I think those those of us who work on this issue every day don't want us just to be in this temporary moment where it's all about number reduction and then we move on to the next issue. Because the, it's going to cycle back. It will cycle back. Yeah. And I think, you know, the CIA used to call these type of policies that aren't well conceived in other parts of the world blowback, mm -hmm. right? If you go and you support someone temporarily and then against your proxy enemy and then they come back, you build up a militia that you got to deal with later, they call that blowback. And I do think that some of the cyclical analysis of violence the policing strategies have produced what we see on the streets as blowback. So what is the police role? Well, you have to first trust the police. I always tell you, you don't call the police unless you trust the police. I mean, and that's something that I think, you know, we're seeing across the country. And I've seen phenomenal policing, by the way. I've worked with the 8th District, lived in the 8th District. I've seen guys on our block at my, the block I was living on at 2, 3 a.m., you know, eight cop cars come, and I've seen extraordinary cops de-escalate. I've seen that. And I've gone up to them every time I've seen it and wanted to hug them and thank them. So I've, I've done that. I've sat in roll calls all night, night long and talked to police officers. But I've also experienced, personally, I, my first and only disorderly conduct you know, uh, charge was when I was dropping off kids out of a van and I had the you know, audacity to simply to ask the officer why I'm being pulled over and thrown up on the car and put on myself probation for a year. Uh, when, this is like a couple decades ago. Yeah. I was a little, a little bit more charged up at the time, but I've experienced. <laughs> I, I was joke. I was joke because I think I had just watched the, a movie on the Black Panthers, and and there was one of a, uh, and they were talking about monitoring arrests, and I realized that sometimes even those theoretical things about observing arrests, they look good like in the movies and stuff, but you know when you're being stopped, you don't try to say anything. I know. I realize that. You know, but but in all truthfulness, the the other day in a room I had 75 year old, 75 guys. You know, 18 to 25 year olds, they've been on a waiting list forever, desperately trying to get in the program. I asked all of them one question. How many of you had your first encounter with the police at 10 or younger? And at least 85% of the hands went up. And we're talking about kids that were put into cars. And, I, and I'll, I'll never forget a story, because I was doing a program with like young eight, nine, 10 year olds once, driving downtown, three of them were in my car, and we were seeing the Sears Tower at the time, and, and we were joking about it, and to talking about architects, and I was saying, maybe one day you can all be architects, one of the first trip downtown. And they all laughed and joked, and they said, they said Rami, they'll never let us be an architect. Uh, and then one of them asked, what do you want to be? And they had this conversation. One of them said, I want to be a teacher. And they joked and they laughed. They said, they're never going to let you be a teacher. And then finally, the third one said, I want to be a police officer. And they all busted up laughing. They're never going to let you be a police officer. <laughs> and then I finally interjected. I said, I said, I have two questions. One, who is they? Right? And these are eight and nine-year-olds. And they said, Romney, you know who they is. They are the ones that own all the stuff and run it. I said, OK, fair enough. I said, and why won't they let you be architects, police officers, teachers? And these are eight and nine year olds. We have records. We have records. And you know, the tragic, uh, I, I, was always, I was shook by that. And the, the tragedy about that was they weren't that wrong, in fact. Mm -hmm that all of the juvenile stops and that they had as young juveniles, the number of times that they've been thrown up on cars and they've been in neighborhoods that were heavily policed and eventually find their way into formal uh, consideration when they're being tried as adults, that the juvie records can be admitted and considered as a variable when they're being tried as adults. And 
They knew that as eight and nine-year-olds and had checked out and given up. And much of that was in direct relationship to the police. And so this idea, I know people sometimes hear organizers and activists talk about police relationships and police reform and think maybe that we're being overly harsh. But it is a day-to-day -day reality. You don't, if you live in neighborhoods and your whole life you've been traumatized by this relationship, mm -hmm. you simply will not call those people at two or three o'clock in the morning when there's a shooting. And so we have to fundamentally rebuild the fabric of that relationship and confidence when it comes to the community and police. It's so true. I think about when I was uh, at the school and you know there was a lot of violence. Uh, the school that I was at was in Roseland and there was uh, you know a lot of violence in the neighborhood, a lot of like crimes that would take place. And it was interesting when I, when I first got there, I didn't un fully understand like what would happen, but there would be you know families that would come in um, and they would want to talk to myself or the assistant principals about you know who shot so and so right. and then you know my first reaction was let's call the police you right. know and you know the response was no we're, we're telling you you need to go and you right. should go do that because there was a fundamental distrust and not on like you know small things like someone stole someone's bike but who killed somebody or who shot someone and it, it is real I think it all boils down to and we try to do this at finger is like how do we begin to build relationship so I think when I hear about your work, Eddie Mann, and I think about well, it's our work, other community-based organizations and people doing this work, it really boils down to relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really truly get to full trust until you build relationship. And I think there are paths, as we talked about pathways, there are pathways forward uh, for that as well to build up you know, community and police relations, although yeah. it will take time. <laughs> we didn't get here overnight and we won't get out of it overnight. On that point though, you and me, I know we want to turn to the audience, here in a second, but um, pathways and pathways forward. Um, what have you seen beginning to work? Uh, you talk I, oftentimes about shifting the field of philanthropy. You often talk about shifting uh, the paradigm. Um, where do you see us getting traction in that kind of set of conversations, and where do you see persistent challenges? I think there's. I think just overall, if if anyone's you know read a couple of the latest books in philanthropy that have really taken the philanthropic world by storm, uh, one is Decolonizing Wealth by Edgar Villanueva. The other was Winners Take All by Adnan Girdadas. Like there's been this push, I think a lot blowback, if you will, from those two books that have really, I think, caused uh, philanthropy as a whole and some of the biggest institutions here in our city and really across the country to take a look uh, about how. Uh, we are truly in, in engaging relationship with communities. I think, uh, at least as, as I saw it at a certain point in my own journey, it was, as I think about sitting in, as a school principal and receiving philanthropic dollars, it was a very paternalistic relationship. Like, you know, a grant-making organization would give us this money, they would give us this money so we should do it like this, and they knew the better way to do it. We'd have to kind of shape-shift in order to, um, you know, get the dollars to deliver on whatever we were trying to, to do. And I've seen over the last, uh, gosh, probably year and a half, two years, a true seismic shift in philanthropy in folks really trying to become in relationship with folks to understand how to um, best support right. and not coming from this vantage point of, you know, we as the philanthropists understand how to do the work better. Oftentimes there's this idea that, you know, I come from business or I come from this and this is how you do that work out in Rosemary. This is how you do that work out in, you know, wherever, Inglewood. Um, but that has been huge. And I think, is it exactly where it needs to be? No. Yeah. But I think there are waves uh, being made in it which are, which are critical to this work. So we don't have that much time, um, but I want to open it up for questions. I think there's a board around here somewhere. It should tell you where you can text your questions to or how to, how to do that. But you can also, if you're here with us in the room, uh, raise your hand and a mic will come around and we will uh, call on you. Great, the first brave soul way in the back. <laughs> Hi, um, I think it was a few months ago, perhaps, uh, we, we hosted a bunch of mayors from all the major cities, yeah. and they were talking about, were you at that meeting? Yes. yes. Uh, anyway, so they were talking about what they did to reduce uh, violence in their city, and it seemed to me that the arrows were going down much steeper in Atlanta and Baltimore and L.A. than in Chicago. But I couldn't quite, I mean, I was there for the entire conference, and I couldn't quite understand or get 
what was it that they were doing that was different from Chicago? And do you have an idea on why are they more successful? And, you know, L.A. is not that different from Chicago. Yeah. But they seem to suggest, anyway, with their numbers, that they were doing much better. Yeah, I mean, I was at that and, in fact, you know, participated in, in some of the organizing of it and one of our lead organizers were on the panel. Um, and this is, this, is a, this is being positioned as, of course, an important comparison, especially a big city like Chicago. We're not the highest per capita in the country, uh, but we certainly are the lar- one of the largest big cities that continue to get associated with these spikes. And we're often juxtaposed with New York and L.A. I- I'll be honest. Uh, I- I'll-, I'll say this about Chicago, that, um, and-, and to Liz's last point, I think we're beginning to you know, get it right, quite frankly. I'm, beginning, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, even in not just because of the reduction that we've seen in the last couple of years, but I, I have never seen in the last, and I've been doing this work for a quarter of a century. Um, I have never seen a more promising confluence of people, uh, private, public sector foundations beginning to it. Partly because it's difficult conversations like winners take all, decolonizing wealth. Because I think we have to grapple with this. Partly because I think people are beginning to realize we have to really organize across ego, across boundaries, across sectors, come together, and that this is not going to be a short-term fix. I so I'm hopeful about Chicago's ability to really still emerge as a dynamic, innovative model for not only uh, those other centers across the country that are experiencing this, but even up against New York and L.A. Because the one thing I'm still a little apprehensive about the comparison in New York and L.A. is I want to see what neighborhoods you're really talking about in New York and L.A. I've been to those places, and I've seen strategies that work, but I'm also really concerned about displacement of black and brown people from urban centers and then simply saying, okay, we've reduced violence in those neighborhoods. I really want to see where black and brown communities, along with everyone else, are thriving, have a stake in the future. And I know places like New York and LA have had experiences with extraordinary degrees of gentrification in neighborhoods that were otherwise, you know, once, you know, much more uh, populated by, uh, you know, African American, Latino and other brown communities. So I think Chicago can emerge as a model. We don't, the, the simple answer is we don't quite yet fully know, but I do think we do know that the more holistic approaches, the more you heard each of those mayors talk about, the more touch points they had with those individuals in the communities, the more a Effective the results were. Yeah, and I think we do. I think there's this thing about like we don't know. We we actually do know, and I think it truly yeah. boils down to what we're talking about: holistic, uh, holistic interventions. It also boils down to relationship. And you know, there's. I was talking backstage about you know if we think about what happens, let's say in in, in Highland Park or in Naperville or in Orland Park, like no one needs a, a research study or a, a, you know some type of like data to say why we need good schools or why you know kids need mentors or right. why they, like they, these are things that we just know to be true. When I think about our communities, like it truly is the same, right? It's it's not um, it's not rocket science about I think what will ultimately um, what will ultimately affect uh, numbers in terms of, of violence here in our city. It is those basics. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, and it's going to come from online. We'll take one from online. Um, coming from a Midwestern city, I hear a lot about how violent Chicago is. How can the narrative be changed by media to demonstrate the progress Chicago is making when it comes to violence? I wonder if I can intervene and also, because I saw a couple of eager hands in the audience, maybe if we combine the cluster of those questions and attempt to speak to the two that were there. I'm sorry, you as well. Yeah, go ahead. I've, um, one, I've been a fan of Iman since it started, so it's amazing. And um, I've been doing fundraising in Chicago for almost 30 years, and um, I, turned 50 this year and had an epiphany that we've been doing it all wrong about last year and read Decolonizing Wealth and Winner Takes All and I'm totally on the other side. Um, I look around this room and I see you have a lot of philanthropists in this room. You have people who run foundations, most of them still white. Um, tell us what, you know, if in this urgency, what do we do next? Like, how do we get this, com- instead of just buying the book on Amazon and then thinking we read it, like, what can we really... Sorry. Um, you know, so uh, what could we do next? 
Well, I think it's, it's too with the, the, this woman who was, and I apologize, I don't remember her name, who spoke uh, about two panels or so before. I think it boils down to where you sit in the city, where you sit in your own workplace. I think sometimes we approach this as if we have to you know, seismically shift our own individual lives or somehow show up at Iman and do a community project there and everyone goes there. I don't think it's about that. I think there is power in where, where each of us sit, whether that that means you work at Blue Cross Blue Shield, or you are a teacher in Chicago public schools, or you, you know, have some other job here in the city. Where is it that you sit, and then what are the moves that you can make to um, either to, whether it's bring more voices to the table or to create opportunities and access at your own job? So I think it's 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 not about um, rushing to any one thing, but it really is about utilizing your own power and privilege in the space in which you sit. Uh, you know, interesting for me too, you know, I read both those books, have had, had engaging conversations with both those individuals, and also sit on a foundation board that has been, you know, get, has given over half a billion dollars in the last 15 years to predominantly communities of color across the country doing amazing things. I, I think the, the realization for me is also this, that listen, you know, took $13 billion per post-World War Europe to rebuild devastated, uh, infrastructures that then finally led to a thriving set of possibilities in you know Europe uh, post World War II. It's called the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. and there was a political uh, impetus for why we were so invested in this. But I think we have a major political impetus now, and we need to begin to fundamentally revisit the type of dollars that we're investing, what we expect to see in our urban infrastructures that have been criminally disinvested from for decades and begin to then uh, uh, really manage expectations so that begin to start uh, seeing the scale from a five to possibly a 10 year transitions into certain, certain sets of outcomes and outputs that are really critical. Those conversations are happening, I think, in Chicago in real, real ways. I think in addition to those type of texts like decolonizing wealth and winners take all, the, the one thing those texts were a little short on, quite frankly, I mean, Edgar did a better job, but I think we have an opportunity to write a different type of text in cities like Chicago that are a little more granular, that wrestle with that wrestle with some of the more difficult ways in which we have to negotiate power. We all sit and occupy positions of power in one way or the other. And we could you know, rail against it, or we can leverage it effectively to really make you know, sustainable uh, impact on the ground. And that's what I think, again, Chicago has a great history of that. We've, we've been in, up in each other's faces. We've wrestled with these conversations for decades. And I'd like to continue to believe and have hope that this city can continue to incubate the type of solutions that will resonate not only, again, in this region, but really across the country. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm seeing some of the pieces on the ground beginning to take place, thanks to people like Liz in mm -hmm. Chicago Beyond. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.